All right, guys, welcome back for your introductory right up quadrant ultrasound lecture. Let's get to it. As always, first we'll cover basic technique. As for all abdominal imaging, you can use the curvilinear transducer with the advantage of its higher resolution, which is why it's often used as the go-to transducer for abdominal imaging and even casually referred to as the abdominal probe. Or can use the phased array transducer. Its main benefits include better penetration and a smaller footprint which helps us slide between ribs easier. Newer generation systems such as the Sonosat Export provide really excellent image resolution with the phased array transducer, making the curvilinear transducer less critical for abdominal imaging. Let's cover patient positioning. Patient positioning is all about helping the gallbladder emerge from underneath the right costal margin. Sitting the patient up to 45 degrees can help with this. The left lateral decubitus position is likely the ideal position for this exam and yields consistent high quality images. Either way, taking a deep breath can help push the gallbladder out from underneath the costal margin and will further improve your images no matter the position you're using. So I usually ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold it and then do a few seconds of imaging. Most other ultrasound images are obscured by a deep breath so don't do this for every exam you do but in the right upper quadrant exam it is highly beneficial. So first we need to figure out how to actually find the gallbladder. First, place the transducer in the epigastrium and sagittal plane with the indicator pointing towards the head. Then slowly sweep to the right while pointing up into the liver and wait for the gallbladder and portal vein to come into view. This is the corresponding sagittal sweep. In the beginning of this sweep, we see only the liver and some adjacent bowel gas. And as we go more medially, we start seeing the portal triad, which helps us identify the gallbladder. So portal triad and gallbladder. The relationship to the portal vein is used to reliably identify the gallbladder. The portal vein comes within 1 to 2 centimeters of the gallbladder neck. This relationship is reliable because the cystic duct connects the gallbladder neck to the common bile duct and travels in the main lobar fissure seen here. Once the gallbladder is reliably identified via its relationship to the portal vein, we scan through it in sagittal and transverse planes. This is how to do just that. Sweep through the gallbladder from side to side, either by fanning or moving the transducer on the skin. Then, ideally keep the gallbladder in view while switching planes and sweep all the way from bottom to top. Like any organ sweep, it's only complete if the organ goes completely out of view at the margins of your scan. So here's the corresponding ultrasound clip. First, our sagittal sweep all the way from side to side, the gallbladder going completely in and out of view, switching planes, and now scanning all the way from top to bottom and bottom to top. While we're scanning through the gallbladder, we look for stones and sludge within it while looking for pericolocystic fluid around it. One potential pitfall is mistaking reverberation artifact for sludge. Sludge is dependent whereas reverberation artifact will be seen on the side of the gallbladder closest to the probe. This is a good example of reverberation artifact. You can see it located towards the top of the gallbladder. It goes beyond the gallbladder walls and it's not located dependently like sludge would be. Don't worry, there's plenty of sludge to come. After looking for abnormalities within and around the gallbladder, we measure the gallbladder wall diameter. And this is how you do that. Just freeze an image at a representative mid portion of the gallbladder, then hit calipers and measure across the anterior gallbladder wall. Posterior to the gallbladder, measurements are not reliable because the gallbladder wall appears thicker than it actually is due to posterior acoustic enhancement. The measurement is also not reliable adjacent to bowel gas due to the scatter artifact the bowel gas creates obscuring the border of the gallbladder wall. Finally, we evaluate the patient for the presence of sonographic Murphy sign by simply pressing down with the transducer immediately above the gallbladder and asking the patient whether this elicits pain. After the gallbladder is evaluated, the common bile duct is identified and measured to finish the right upper quadrant scan. The portal vein, once again, serves as the major landmark for its identification. This clip shows a gallbladder fossa sweep in transverse plane, moving more and more superior until the gallbladder goes out of view, then the portal vein comes in view here, then the image is frozen when the common bile duct is seen just anterior to the portal vein and it is then measured. The common bile duct is measured inner wall to inner wall. Write down any questions you may have on technique and feel free to ask during your hands-on session. Alright, finally time to have some fun. Let's take a look at some pathology. Case 1. 
identify the portal vein here. This is the gallbladder neck through its relationship to the portal vein as already seen. Therefore, this is the gallbladder fundus. We're sweeping through it in sagittal plane. There's nothing seen within it. Same sweep in transverse plane. We're following the gallbladder to the top, portal vein, common bowel duct, and sweeping back down to the gallbladder. We don't see anything within it. There's no gallbladder wall thickening. There's no pericolal cystic fluid. This is a normal exam. This is a sweep through the portal system. We see the portal vein here. Common bowel duct is seen here. And we can actually follow it all the way out of the liver and down into the pancreas. This is an exceptional view. Don't expect this every time. Here, the common bowel duct is reliably identified. It's not torturous. It runs perfectly parallel and just anterior to the portal vein. This differentiates it from the hepatic artery, which is typically tortuous, cannot be seen perfectly aligned with the portal vein, and also contains flow when investigated with color Doppler. So long story short, this was a normal, limited right upper quadrant ultrasound exam with really beautiful anatomy for review. Case two, take a look at this sweep. Less help from now on. Identify the portal vein. You can see the common bowel duct. Identify the gallbladder through its relationship to the portal vein. Take a look inside of the gallbladder. Can you see anything? Here's another sweep. Taking a look at the same patient in transverse plane. Sweeping all the way through the gallbladder. All right, all right, I'm sure you all saw it. We got cholelithiasis. So let's review our anatomy and pathology. We see the liver containing the portal vein. We know it's the portal vein because it enters the gallbladder at about the midpoint of the liver. It also has bright white echogenic walls, which sets it apart from other veins, which typically do not have that degree of connective tissue in their walls. The common bile duct is seen just anterior to the portal vein as expected. And through the main lobar fissure, we know that via the cystic duct, the common bile duct connects to the gallbladder. Therefore, this is reliably identified as the gallbladder. The gallbladder, of course, contains stones, many small stones, casting a clean shadow. So how do we know those are gallstones? Gallstones are echogenic, meaning bright white. They cast shadows. They are dependent and mobile, meaning that they are seen lying against the posterior gallbladder wall when the patient is imaged sitting up, but can be seen falling into the fundus of the gallbladder when the patient assumes the left lateral decubitus position. Remember, the fundus of an organ is the part furthest away from its opening. The only time the gallstones will not be mobile is when they are impacted in the gallbladder neck. This is actually the most important area of the gallbladder to image because impacted stones are most likely to be symptomatic and to progress to cholecystitis. So how good are emergency physicians at diagnosing gallstones? In the three studies published in the emergency medicine literature that I've looked at, sensitivity varies from 86 to 96% and specificity from 78 to 97%. So just another bread and butter emergency medicine diagnosis established within 15 minutes of seeing the patient. Next case. Number three, take a minute to look at the sweep. How's the gallbladder look? You see anything within it? I don't, it's normal gallbladder. Anything else? Hopefully you see the abnormality, but if not, let's take a look at the still. See the abnormality? I hope so. The common bowel duct appears to be pretty dilated. Here we see the common bowel duct again this time with color Doppler superimposed. Color Doppler is often superimposed on the common bile duct to help distinguish it from the other structures in the portal triad because the portal vein and the hepatic artery have flow within them and the common bile duct does not. So what's the diagnosis? We got a dilated common bile duct. What's the normal common bile duct measurement? In young adults, the normal common bile duct diameter is less than four millimeters. However, as we age, some dilatation of the common bile duct is normal. So the mnemonic for people 40 and older is to take their age, divide it by 10, put millimeters behind it, and you're done. Sounds complicated? Well, it's not. So an 80-year-old person, divided by 10, that's 8, 
millimeters. So the upper limit of normal is eight millimeters in an 80 year old person, seven millimeters in a 70 year old person, six millimeters in a 60 year old person, you get it. It should also be noted that post cool cystectomy, the common bile duct is commonly dilated. This is termed the reservoir effect. This is why right upper quadrant ultrasound is generally not useful in patient status post cool cystectomy unless a stone is visualized within the duct itself, which is actually relatively rare. So keep this in mind when working up abdominal pain in these patients. Right upper quadrant ultrasound is unlikely to provide management altering information. So what's the main landmark for finding the common bile duct again? You remember, it's the portal vein. The common bile duct runs just anterior and perfectly parallel with the portal vein. With color Doppler you can see that there's no flow within the structure, which again confirms that it's the common bile duct and not a vascular structure such as the portal vein or hepatic artery. It approaches the portal vein in size and is therefore clearly abnormal. In lab action, we see a normal gallbladder here and a dilated common bile duct seen just entered toward the portal vein here. Man, I'm starting to get a hang of this. What's next? Case four. All right, gallbladder sweep. This is a tough one. Can you make out anything? One more time, different angle. You see anything now? All right, here's the corresponding still. Try to make out some anatomic details. What do you see? So this is the feared and ominous wall echo shadow or west sign. So we can see the liver clearly and up against the liver edge as expected is the gallbladder wall. Then we see a bright white echo casting a dark shadow. This is a large call stone. So wall, echo, shadow, or west for short. So reviewing the pathology in live action again, we see the portal vein clearly right here. And so not seeing the gallbladder at that point is very concerning, especially when you then realize there's a large shadow obscuring it. The moral of the story is that if you can't see the gallbladder, be afraid, be very afraid. Case five. Here's our friend, the gallbladder sweep. Take a look at the anatomy. See if you can identify any pathology. Okay. Here's a still the same. What do you see now? Now measuring the anterior gallbladder wall where it interfaces with the liver edge. Remember, we do not measure posteriorly or where it interfaces with bowel gas. So what's the diagnosis? Cholecystitis. Quick review of the anatomy and pathology. We see the liver and the gallbladder. We see an impacted gallstone in the gallbladder neck. Remember, those are trouble. It's casting a clean, dark shadow. And we see a bunch of little gallstones also casting shadow. There's a thickened gallbladder wall and likely some pericholecystic fluid seen right here. Do you know what the number one ultrasound finding in cholecystitis is? Gallstones! Trick question, but these really are seen in 90 to 95% of cases. Of course, there are just a few cases of acalculus cholecystitis, but the vast majority of cases of cholecystitis have associated gallstones. You are, of course, thinking of sonographic Murphy sign, which is a relatively sensitive finding, but much less so than gallstones. It's only seen in 65 to 80% of patients with cholecystitis, depending on which study you're looking at. So what are the other findings associated with cholecystitis? We've already talked a little bit about sonographic Murphy sign. Then, of course, we know about a thickened gallbladder wall and pericholecystic fluid. Are there any other causes of gallbladder wall thickening? Unfortunately, there are quite a few. So this finding in isolation can be pretty difficult to interpret. So how good are emergency physicians at diagnosing cholecystitis? Well, awesome of course. Isn't that why they call us jack of all trades, master of everything? Or they should anyway. But really, let's take a look at the data. Summer and colleagues published on this in Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2010. That's star date 20138397. I mean, that's the PubMed ID. Anyway. They enrolled 193 patients, and these are the test characteristics they found for acute cholecystitis. You see that emergency physicians had a 87% sensitivity and radiology ultrasounds 83% sensitivity. There's no real difference here in confidence intervals. Specificity again was similar at 82 and 86%. And 
our positive predictive values were 44 and 59 percent. Now remember, as emergency physicians, we're most concerned with the negative predictive value of our tests. And this has really good test characteristics with a negative predictive value of 97% for emergency physician performed ultrasound and approximately equal 95% for radiology ultrasound. Now, let's take a look at the individual ultrasound findings that we know are associated with acute cholecystitis, namely sonographic Murphy sign, gallbladder wall thickening, and pericholecystic fluid. You can see that individually, their sensitivities are not that great. However, taken together, we know that as in the previous table, the sensitivity becomes quite good. So, just keep this in mind. The absence of any one of these findings does not exclude cholecystitis. However, the absence of all of them does. It's also worth pointing out that pericholecystic fluid is not particularly sensitive at only 26%. However, it is quite specific at 94%. Taking a look at another study from 2001, we find similar performance. Sensitivity of 91% and specificity of 66% for cholecystitis. This study enrolled 109 patients. For gallstones, the sensitivity was 96% and the specificity was 88%. So again, pretty good performance by emergency physicians. So as we've seen in these studies, the combination of gallstones, thickened gallbladder wall, and sonographic Murphy sign are highly sensitive and moderately specific for cholecystitis. Yet another great case. I wonder what's up next. K6. So this is a classic case right here. Let's take a look at these images. Try to decide what you see there. Alright. What's the diagnosis? It's gas in the duodenum. This is the number one false positive in my experience. Reviewing the anatomy here, we see the liver as usual, and we see a duodenum with a relatively clean shadow that does appear similar to the type of shadow that a stone would cast, as opposed to the dirty shadow that we typically expect with air artifact. However, higher density material in duodenum can look just like this. So how can we avoid this pitfall? Good technique, of course. Use the portal vein to find the gallbladder, and scan through the gallbladder in both planes. Poop. Fascinating. K7. All right, what do you say here? Standard sagittal gallbladder sweep. What do you think is going on? Cholecystitis with cholelithiasis and heavy sludging. Quick review of the pathology. Sagittal gallbladder sweep. Here's the gallbladder wall anteriorly and posteriorly. The gallbladder is entirely sludge filled and contains many bright white echogenic stones casting dark shadows. In the right clinical context, this is highly concerning for cholecystitis. The sludge looks nothing like a reverberation artifact, which would only be seen at the top of the screen right here. Case 8. Take a look at this transverse sweep. Try to identify the gallbladder. Not particularly difficult. Then look for abnormalities within it or around it. Same thing in sagittal plane here. Identify the gallbladder. Look for abnormalities within it and around it. So what do you think? Cholecystitis with gallbladder wall thickening and pericholecystic fluid. Quick review shows the gallbladder here, containing many bright white echogenic stones casting dark shadows. The gallbladder wall is seen here. It is very edematous with a diameter of at least 2 to 3 centimeters, all highly consistent with cholecystitis. Case 9. Sagittal sweep. Focus on finding the gallbladder and looking within it. See anything? Pretty obvious. All right, axial sweep. Subtle abnormality there. Let's take a look at the same thing with some color. What do you see now? Here's the measurement of that prior structure. So what do you think is going on? I'm sure by now you picked up on the large amount of cholelithiasis and you probably also noted the dilated common bile duct with this measurement greater than 4 millimeters. But you could also actually visualize the cholelithiasis. So let's take a look at that again. The gallbladder is reliably identified through its connection 
to the calm bowel duct via the main lobar fissure. And it's seen chalk full of gallstones. In this axial sweep, we can follow the calm bowel duct and see a hyperechoic structure within it, and it even is seen casting a shadow. Don't believe me? Take a look at the still. Here again is the hyperechoic structure within the common bowel duct, and it's casting a shadow. Case 10, and I promise this is the last one. So here's another gallbladder sweep. Observe the relationship of the gallbladder neck to the portal vein. Here's the neck, here's the fundus, and here's some sludge seen within the fundus of the gallbladder. Again, gallbladder neck, portal vein, and main lobar fissure connecting the two. In transverse plane, we can see the gallbladder coming into view here, and we can follow it all the way down to the fundus where we start visualizing the sludge again. And what do you see here? I hope you're picking up on the common bowel duct running just anterior and perfectly parallel with the portal vein. But what is also seen is the inferior vena cava here. Again, the inferior vena cava and portal vein have flow within them. You can even see a piece of the hepatic artery right here, and then we see the common bowel duct anterior to that. This is called a triple channel sign. IVC, portal vein, common bowel duct. So what's the diagnosis? Well, all we really saw was sludge and an otherwise unremarkable exam. Sludge can be associated with and actually cause cholecystitis, but it can also be asymptomatic and resolve spontaneously. As always in medicine, things are not black and white. Unless you do an ultrasound. Booyah! All right, that's all the nerdy jokes I got for you today. Write down any questions you might have, and I will answer them in the hands-on. See you then.